How are you? Good, how are you doing? Okay. Snow screw you up in any way? Not really. My car is pretty good in the snow. I was came back there. from our Carmel house on Sunday and the flight, I mean, we got in, but we were about three hours late and we were supposed to work at Everett yesterday morning. Saw so that was canceled. Yeah. So, so that made, because I didn't get to bed until about one o'clock and yeah. I didn't want to drive up to Everett on a couple hours sleep. I thought it would have been a horrible commute, too. Your parents home yet? No, no they're still there. Wow. Yeah, it's a long trip. It's a long trip. time I called you, I didn't want to put this in writing. Oh yeah, actually I was just thinking about that today. For some reason I can't find the old building. There's a new one that um, I should be able to get from Bill. Okay. And you're on it, so technically you should have it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I guess I do get all the memos. It doesn't give a ton of information, it just gives our billing numbers and what we bill and what we actually collect. That's the issue. Um, what rate you guys have, do you know? What rate? As far as what percentage of what you bill do you collect? Uh, I, I don't know the right answer. We're about 50%. Uh, percent, to, huh? We're about 50%. 50%. Yeah. But the, the big difference at the university, I don't know if this <coughs> all university, like on the east side, is you have um, a facility charge. The east side doesn't. Doesn't. Just the UW. And if that doesn't come to us, that goes to the UWFC. So that wouldn't show up in our billing numbers. All right. Well, this may not get us anywhere, but uh, if you have it, it's yeah, not I'll, urgent. Yeah, it gets sent to Bill. setting up the dinner at the meeting. All the fellows are going to the meeting, aren't they? Yeah. Are they all doing well? Yeah, I think so. Seems seem to me they are. We're busy. The first year, at least. Do you, do you think we need to buy a new computer, or we... This thing's amazing. We probably should. This thing's incredible as far as holding up as long as it has. We've had it four years now. Old faithful, it always works. But yeah, I, we probably more should. Uh, Jerry? Or, Good morning. Anything out of anything? Where did I? You never know. You never know.
Oh, where's their brain? <laughs> you gotta wonder sometimes. <sighs> Fortunately, she worked from home on Tuesdays, so she wasn't here to actually observe. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So when are you going to be a grandpa? Uh, it's supposed to be March 20th. Okay, so it's coming up. Yeah, we're supposed to go there in Boston now, living in Boston. Right. We're supposed right. to go to Boston uh, this Friday. Oh, good. But my son Jonathan said to me, well, so they're living in a two-bedroom um, townhouse in Back Bay. And he said, well, getting ready for the baby... We didn't have an extra room for the baby, so we just sold the extra bed so we could make a baby. Yeah. So. so they have an air mattress for you to put on the floor? Yeah, or, or a little bed, bed and breakfast close to it. <coughs> That's what we found was the most practical thing. We got one of those little air mattresses that we put down if we have extra company. I mean, we got three bedrooms, but every now and then you have to put too many people. Yeah. Well, we'll see. Told him to go ahead and make an appointment. There's a place not far away. I think I had a reservation. Good. Yeah. Anything new with you? No, things are pretty, pretty calm right now. I do want to talk to you about um, Aaron. Remember, she's got the shrimp allergy. Yeah. And then you gave her the oral challenge with the same shrimp that she ate before. Is there any possibility that? If we had fresh, raw shrimp, we would end up with a different outcome? Well, instead of processed, you know, like this stuff was. Well, you think if it's real shrimp allergy or protein in the shrimp, we'd wind up with a worse outcome. Okay. It would be more allergenic. If somehow it was an additive, a preservative, you'd do better. <clears throat> what, did, what? Just leave it alone? Just... And how much she cares about being able to eat it. <laughs> she loves shrimp. She just loved shrimp her entire life. Her whole life, except when she got this bag of frozen shrimp at Albertsons. And um, that's you know, I had a patient the other day who had... Good morning. Oh, no. I bought a serious reaction, nausea, vomiting, um, 911 called with... Um, but it was a big bag of something from Costco. And then oh, they sorry. ate the same food again, not from, you know, not processed in this plastic, you know, large container yeah. from Costco. And it was fine. And then stupidly ate the same thing from Costco again and had the same <laughs> reaction. So, I mean, clearly it was a toxic reaction. It kind of mimicked. Yeah, I've had scramble with yeah, yeah. Look for all the world. That scromboid, it's a it's a bacteria that can get into old seafood, yeah. and I certainly ate old seafood, and it, it's a histaminergic type reaction. So I was flushing, I was wheezing. Yeah, it looked for all the world like an allergic reaction. But yeah, I've, I mean, we could go back and revisit it and see. Well, I I don't want to put you to that. I mean, if you think there's a reason that it might be that it was something in the process, because well, they came from Thailand, you know they. You know how that is. And uh, she's eaten shrimp her entire life and never had a reaction. And all of a sudden she gets this one bag, and then she brought the bag to you and you gave her an oral challenge with the same shrimp instead of a different shrimp. And she's going goofy. I mean, it's like... Did she react? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, now that we have component analysis, I don't think we had that at the time. You know. Yeah, no, this was, more like, it was probably four or five years ago that yeah. she gave her the oral challenge, yeah. Let me pull up the chart. But, but I mean, the thing, the thing is that, um, you know, we've gone to Thailand, we've gone to Australia, we're going down to um, Belize. And, you know, all this is the seafood. Um, she'll eat um, sushi that's probably on the same cutting board as shrimp and never have a reaction. And it's really a weird thing. And... Um, Every now and then I go to a dinner, okay, and I'll bring something home, and it'll have like a lobster sauce on it. And then when I wake up in the morning, 
It's gone. Great. Videos are working. Just for now. Hi, Greg. How are you? I'm thinking about. Thank you for seeing my oh, weird sorry. people that I've seen. Oh, thanks for sending you too. Wow, no, no, they're loving you. It's wonderful uh, that you'll see them. Team effort. Morning, Greg. Jerry Hill. Nice to meet you as well. Um, <laughs> Some people call in in their pajamas. Yeah, a lot of people want to watch. <laughs> and then coming from 40 miles away, I'm the first one. <laughs> oh, I was a commuter. I'm Actually, I-5 had nothing. Yeah. Getting to I-5 was a challenge. Yeah, but I got my wife out of bed a half an hour earlier, and she gets here at 6.20. She's just grouching at me. We didn't have to leave at <laughs> 5 o'clock. We could have left at 5.45. So, yeah, but I didn't know. How was it? I, we canceled our Everett clinic yesterday. I was supposed to drive. Oh, really? To yeah, Everett, but the streets were pretty bad yeah, yesterday. No, I'm ready. But, you know... Some. <laughs> Once you get on the main streets, it's not so bad. They're just slush. I thought I was sort of surprised how how well the streets were. They didn't ask me. I mean, I was willing to drive up there, but at six in the morning, they texted me and said, "We're going to cancel." I said, "Fine, I'll sleep." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, we, Darn. We have an okay. in department in my clinic, and I emailed him Sunday afternoon about a lady that I needed to get medialization of a, a paralyzed vocal cord. And he sends me an email back like five minutes later. I don't do that, but my partner does. Let me call him. So his partner sends me an email ten minutes later on a Sunday. I can't even get my own dogs to answer the phone. It's on the Roddy. Because but anyway, he's, he's awesome. He, he responds to every question. Yeah, he's great. He's got a lot of patience for idiots like me. And I, like, he I, I, I keep sending him emails. Assuming that's breaking HIPAA regulation. Well, I'd send, I just I didn't send him an email about the patient. I just wanted to see if he could see him. He just says I don't medialize vocal cords, and he says my partner does. But I mean, the whole thing happens on a Sunday afternoon, and I can't get our guys eight five Monday through Friday. <laughs> yeah, well, most calls. of the UW is nowhere near that efficient now. <laughs> <laughs> well, am I still in your coffee? No, no, you're fine. Or that motivated one or the other. But he was just getting ready to leave the country or something. Well, let me take care of this before I go. That's great. So, yeah. So. Andrew, how are you? Good morning. Hey, Mike. How you doing? Did you, are, are you wishing you had your four-wheel drive Tesla today? I have it. It's parked. Mm -hmm. I have it, yeah. <laughs> and now it's great in the snow. Except there's no snow. Well, so. <laughs> but it would handle great in the snow. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I... I you know, if you go to Stevens Pass, you get to park right at the foot of the stairs. I said to Stevens. You get to park right at the foot of the stairs and yeah. charge for free. You know, the question is, what's the etiquette of that? Mm -hmm. First come, first serve, mm -hmm. and then, but then if you stay plugged in all day, it seems like you're you're wasting yeah, one of the things. There should be some. Oh, well, there's just there's got to be a system where once you're charged up, you should down come down back and move it. Down. Nine out of ten days, there's nobody there. Successful at all. Yeah. So. Believe it or not, still, the most of the world is not like you and has a test. So I wish I was, but I'm not there yet. Well, it'll, it'll even leave some charge on this, won't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, eventually, it's going to be... association. Now that the leaves get more than 40 miles <laughs> to charge. Got to leave something behind for the next generation. So, what's up with Steve? Have you heard from him at all lately? Mm -hmm. I guess right. I What about you? What are you doing now that you're retired? You're working in all the public health clinics? And... I don't feel what comes to <laughs> No. You know what you did for money and now doing it for free? I, I did one of those free clinic things at the Seattle Center. Mm -hmm. it, that's just an irregular sort of thing, yeah. Taking some classes. Mm -hmm. Trying to play golf, although. No, they have a house. <laughs> yeah. What kind of class are you doing? Help cooking, dance. Yeah. You said dance. Dance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Arthur Murray uh, dance. Uh, dance. Uh, are you from the place somebody else got it? Yeah. Yeah. They're on Elliot? Yeah. No, the one I go to is the North Seattle. Aurora, the one thirty eight. They have one down on Elliot. Somewhere about that. 
Are they good? Are they working? Well, it depends what you want, I guess. I, I, oh, yeah. I was just wanting to get a nice idea. Yeah. They have a pretty very structured teaching system. Once you sign up, you get a private instructor for six lessons and group sessions. They give you five different dance steps that they usually teach. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 And you can you can do construction requests on things. But you join it? Yeah, I'm I'm not as committed as some people who really get into this. No, I mean we do it probably extravaganza dance things. I'm not. Oh, not a lot. It's an opportunity. I used to let us parse it for the next day. Uh, I've been thinking about it. Just at that Len, whatever happened to your request about us parking in the well, basement? A lot of people uh, they ever say come or couldn't? People were getting ready to go on a cruise. Uh, or it's going to be a wedding or something like that. So we'll see how. It's a lot of reasons to do it. You know, half the Senate from the Canadian Senate. You know, I think it's a guard to come. Some ridiculous amount of money. Today, parking are those ways hard? On the street? It was terrible. At that point, I now park in about an extra block away. It's doable. I can pursue it further, but it wasn't an easy answer. I just wonder if they're going to be stingy, then it's not worth it. Well, they're definitely being stingy because I've been pretty generous to the university. <laughs> and, I, and I lost my parking, uh, the, my building permit to get in here. So they wanted 20 bucks for another one. I said, you know, I've given you a fair amount of money over the years. Maybe you could just replace it. <laughs> no, 20 bucks. Yeah. Sure, we'll replace it for 20 bucks. <laughs> Well, you think about how things have changed. I was thinking the other day when we were over at the University of the Hospital in the little cafeteria in the little side room. Yeah. Remember that? I mean, yeah. Parker was horrible, too. That's the Yeah. It, it, Parker was tough there, too. No question about it, even that early in the morning. Yeah. I'm impressed this many people made it in. For everybody. The lazy ones this morning are the pharma people. We only got two pharma people <laughs> to fill the back row. Is this all being recorded? Yes, it is. <laughs> but for $20, Len, he'll give you a copy. <laughs> and a parking pass for the All right, we all should kick in a dollar. Money.
picture too. I should have the slides. You look like it was a hard trip. It's strange story. It's <laughs> strange story. It's 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 strange story.
uh, any topical antibiotic irrigations, not a spray, adding it to the irrigation bottle. Excellent. Okay. So we'll talk about data. About I thought that, that was snake oil. <laughs> so we actually didn't study snake oil. I, I mean, uh, <laughs> that was just to get you in here, Len. Right. Pretty much everything else has been studied except for snake oil. Right. That's true. true. All right, so David Kennedy, he's really, we in otolaryngology, we consider him the father of modern endoscopic sinus surgery in America. He was the first one who brought it over from Germany in uh, about 1984. And just this last summer at one of our large national meetings, he said, Topical therapy is the future of treatment for chronic sinusitis. That was his keynote address. That was it. Uh, it's not surgery anymore. Surgery is part of it. Go ahead and play with it. And it's not antibiotics anymore. It's topical therapy. Well, it can be antibiotics. We'll chat about that too. So here's the challenge. Um, I've showed you some nice pictures from the past years to wake you up. And, and this is what I get to see on a daily basis. These are the, the slides and PowerPoint presentations I work on. on airplanes when I travel, and people don't like sitting next to me. <laughs> uh, but this patient had a really nice sinus surgery. All the sinuses are wide open, yet this is sucking this nasty, disgusting mucopurial material out of the left maxillary sinus. So from a surgeon's perspective, in a way, this isn't fair. We've done our goal of surgery. We've opened up the sinuses. Usually, it helps, yet it's full of pus and infection. So what's wrong? Is it the pathogen that's resistant? Is it not even a pathogen? Or is it the human host that has some problems and some immune dysfunction? All of those things can be part of it. Or is there a pocket of purulence that's trapped within the sinus? And essentially, I explain to patients that sinuses are, are, can be a collection of abscesses. Just like an abscess on the leg just fits closed off within the head, it's an abscess. <coughs> to drain an abscess, you need to open it. Opening the sinuses allows you to get nice pictures like this. Um, that's one big piece of mucus that a patient expelled and they thought <laughs> they need to share with me. <laughs> 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 it has nothing to do with my talk. <laughs> limited to the nasal cavity, not the sinuses, then spray might be okay. But we have several studies. This is just one of them. Many studies now show that sprays, even in operated sinuses, only deliver the medicine to the front of the nose. They do not penetrate the sinuses. Certainly do not penetrate the frontal sphenoid at that point in the sinuses. So um, how do you get medication there and that's where other research has shown that with large volume, low pressure irrigation, that salt water, even though you're diluting the medication a lot, that salt water will be the vehicle that drives the medication into the sinuses. So uh, this was a, a review that looked at several different things for how to deliver medications to the sinuses. Number one, if a patient has not had sinus surgery, nothing we irrigate up our nose will penetrate the sinuses. No radioactive isotope, no gentian violet, no flow mechanic studies that have been done will penetrate the natural loss of any of our sinuses. Doesn't mean it's bad to irrigate, it just means if we have a true sinus infection, we irrigate with antibiotics and the patient has not had sinus surgery, we shouldn't really expect it to do anything because it's not getting to the site. Uh, the high volume, low pressure, Sinus irrigation bottles, the Neomed is common. There are many other uh, uh, neti pot type devices. Uh, as long as it's a uh, high volume, which is usually about 240 cc's, then that has been shown to help out. Now, how the head is positioned makes a difference. And Paul, I know you've had some of your patients over the years lie on their back over the, over the edge of the bed, and that's a great position. There was a study that came out uh, just about six months ago and if you do a standard sinus irrigation where you're standing over the sink and you tilt your head down, look in the mirror, and you're squirting it up your nose, the fluid will get into your maxillary and ethmoid sinuses just fine, assuming you've had sinus surgery. It does not penetrate very well into the frontals and doesn't get at all into the sphenoid sinuses. That was just shown. They did it with using cadaver heads. 
the only way to get the frontal sinuses penetrated is to put the vertex of the head pointing towards the ground. So you really have to bend over to get it done. And if you think of your frontal sinuses as a tank, you're not going to fill the tank upside down. So you have to tilt that tank so that the opening is pointing up, tilting your head over. The sphenoid sinus, the only way to get the fluid there is to do all that. Have the patient lie on their back, either on their bed, a lot of them will do it in the bathtub or in the shower, because it's a mess if you're irrigating with large volume. But that will get the solution into the sphenoid sinuses. So I started changing what I told patients just a few months ago after this. And it is strange to tell a patient with just, let's say, isolated sphenoid disease after surgery. I want you to lay on your back in the tub or in the shower on your bed and squirt the solution in there and hold it there for five to ten seconds and then blow it out. Uh, some people probably do it, most probably don't. Um, but that's when we see with topical irrigation some of the hardest sinuses to quote fix. It's a sphenoid problem probably for those reasons. So this, the uh, American Rhinologic Society recommends use of the large volume irrigation, recommends against the use, and this is also an international consensus statement uh, called ICAR that came out recently. Uh, several allergists were on that panel as well. They recommended against nasal nebulizers, drops, or sprays. And the desinide has become um, really our go-to steroid, not for any particular reason other than it's very hydrophilic, it's easy to dissolve in saline. Um, Mometazone is another steroid that is worth considering using. It's much more lipophilic, but bedesonide is a common one, and it's been studied a lot. Um, I work with a compounding pharmacy uh, in Washington State, and they're very easy to work with on this. And this is the case that changed my mind about topical bedesonide. Um, you may have seen this at one of my presentations before, because this is my end of one study that changed my practice. So in this 44-year-old gentleman who I uh, had awful chronic sinus disease with polyps and asthma. Uh, I did his surgery eight months prior to this, and he came back and he was all depressed. And uh, I know why once I took a look in his nose. So this is looking in the left nostril. There's a nice yellow polyp over here and here. And all of these are early polyp formations. That's the opening to the sphenoid. And this is just eight months out from surgery, much sooner than I would expect for early polyp recurrence. So I said, all right, let's try this new thing, pedestinide, twice a day. I didn't do anything else, no prednisone, nothing. And he came back two months later, he had a smile on his face, and his ethmoid cavities were wide open, his frontal system was kind of open, polyps were magically gone, sphenoid's still a little tight, but it's open, and it's functioning well. And this is the maxillary sinus here. Still a little bit of inflamed tissue, or edematous tissue. But that was my end of one study that I said, all right, there's something to this pedestinite stuff. Let's start using it. And now it is, in my practice, standard of care for any patient with nasal polyps or inflammatory sinus disease. Um, many patients without polyps and inflammatory sinus disease like GPA I take them to surgery and I'll put them on bedesonide for a month afterwards just to help them heal. And I don't have any data to back that up, I should, but it makes a difference and it really helps. There's um, a nice study that showed no systemic absorption, uh, doesn't suppress our hypoglycemic pituitary adrenal access, doesn't increase intraocular pressures for diabetics, it's great, but it doesn't affect blood sugars, and it makes a difference in our patients. The only challenge is a lot of insurance won't cover it. Um, if I write a prescription for Pulmacor twice a day and I send it to the University of Washington Medical Center Pharmacy, they're going to ask for about $250 per month. If I send it to my compounding pharmacy, if insurance doesn't cover it, the cash price is around $60 per month. Pretty good. They compound it themselves. Uh, and I've been really happy with that. Still not enough for all of our patients to afford, but for uh, a short duration, I think it works well. Any questions about topical steroids before we move on? Yeah, what about the uh, momedicine eluding stem? <clears throat> now that you see this value, do you put that in every time you, or what do you do with that? So the uh, momedicine eluding drug stem is called Propel. Um, I am a consultant for the company, I just disclosed that. Uh, I'm also a huge believer in the product, and I use it in nearly every patient, probably every patient I operate on with polyps. It's a 
uh, bioabsorbable <laughs> polymer that over 30 days slowly releases momentum. And it has been shown in two randomized trials to decrease polyp recurrence, decrease scar tissue formation, uh, and improve patient symptom scores. The, there, there's only one reason not to use it during sinus surgery, and it costs. It's about $750 per device, and you use usually one on each side. At the University of Washington, it just comes out of the cost of doing business. Two years ago, Medicare increased the hospital reimbursement for for ethmoidectomy by 55%. They didn't do it because we instantly got better at doing our sinus surgery. They did it because we were using more expensive disposable instruments, like micro readers, and more disposable uh, implantable devices like the propel. So when my colleagues, who might not you know, have the same uh, incentives as I do, and that's one of the nice things, I don't, I'm really not incentivized to operate at the University of Washington, um, but if I'm in private practice and that $750 is coming out of my pocket, that's a different story, and I can understand their point. They really need to see a cost value for using it, but uh, we have randomized trials that support it. Uh, it's fantastic. There's no downside to do and it helps, not only does it release steroids to help decrease the inflammation, it helps the, the key failure of sinus surgery is uh, lateralization of the middle turbinate. So if the middle turbinate scars to the side of the nose, it's going to block the sinuses. That, and that's the number one reason for sinus surgery failure. It's common, up to about 10% of people. With this device, that never happens, ever. And uh, you know, it's just, you know, you save one patient for vision surgery because of it, it, it pays off pretty do you put that in, do you still then irrigate with budesonide? Or I do. You do. Yeah, I do. I, part of it is just having the patient in a routine of doing a treatment. You know, the more it becomes a habit, the more likely they are to use it. The interesting thing, they have a new device called the S8 coming out. It looks like a squid, an eight-arm squid. And it's designed to be deployed in clinic. Uh, right into someone who's had an ethmoidectomy wide ethmoid system, but the polyps are coming back. You just have to look in there with a little endoscope and push it in, and it deploys. It's going through the FDA approval process right now. But I think that's going to be really exciting, and, and whether or not allergy starts to use that, it would, I think it would be great for an allergist who is uh, comfortable using a straight endoscope to do that from time to time in a patient with polyps who are starting to come back. And again, it's an absorbable thing. You don't have it lasts, this, this product lasts for three months and slowly delivers on that so. The other nice thing about these two products is the compliance is 100%. You don't have to rely on the patient mixing up their bedesonide and putting up this little block actually doing it. You put it in there and you know it's done. Do, do our fellows rotate with you so they would learn how to put this in in uh, clinic? No, no. They don't rotate with me. <laughs> They should. Our residents rotate with two okay. guys. You guys should have, have new, new tricks to do. No, you know. no, you guys should come yeah. over. I know. Cross the cross the board. Right. <laughs> you can do rhinoscopy. Yeah. Uh, it's you know not a tough skill to, to we, learn. How to do. We don't even offer that as a rotation option. Still. No. Well, we have to do it. We're well, supposed to do a certain number of them. Oh, what? Rhinoscopy. I think it would be nice to have you, uh, not a lot, you know, once a month would be nice. Uh, great for you to come down to the OR once and just see a sinus surgery mm -hmm. as well, so you understand yeah. that most sinus surgery uh, done appropriately is not a bloody mess. It's a nice, delicate operation. I'd be paid for that. <laughs> Craig, do you still look through the scope head or do you use a video monitor and just manipulate it with the monitor? Uh, I do both. So uh, most of the time I'll use a video monitor uh, so just everyone in the room can see, but also so I record it. And it's a uh, picture's worth a thousand words when I can play back for the patient the scenario. They'll understand much better than I can say. Such as if they come in with symptoms and I slide an endoscope in, record it and play it back for them and see a big pocket of pus, they're going to say, all right, yeah, I, I feel that. I have a sinus infection. Sign me up for whatever treatment you want. 
versus if they come in with, quote, sinus symptoms, and I put the endoscope in, their sinuses have been operated on so I can see inside all of them, and they're perfectly healthy, and I can explain to them, no, you don't need antibiotics, no pus, no antibiotics. So it, it's helpful for that reason. Uh, there are times with the rigid or straight endoscope where I do not hook it up to the video. Um, the, the system we have in our clinic doesn't quite give us uh, a, a bright enough light, and so if I'm doing something really delicate, uh, I'll take it off the, uh, the video and just use my eye. Since you brought it up, what do you tell people who come in all the time and say, I have chronic sinus, and then you examine them and they're normal? How do you explain that? I tell them the good news, <laughs> and they either cry, or stare me with a blank look, back to you. or uh, they are relieved. But, you know, usually they're disappointed. Uh, that's a, that's a tough thing. What when patients come in and I don't suspect they have a sinus infection, I tell them I'm not going to guess what their health. So I'm going to do if they've had surgery, I'll do a nasal endoscopy. But even with the nasal endoscopy, unless all of the sinuses have been adequately opened, the scope is not x-ray vision, and it only sees in the opened up sinuses. You can still have a completely sealed off stenosis sinus not draining, and that can cause your sinus symptoms. So if I look in there, and I'm still thinking that they have a sinus infection, I have a low threshold to get a CT scan. But I will do that before I treat them. I want to make sure their symptoms are sinusitis related, not facial pain or headache manifestation. Those are tough visits, though. They're never easy. All right, moving on to topical antibiotics. Uh, here's a couple studies we, we just did. This was a little retrospective thing, just to get some baseline data. We looked at, uh, we'll just look at the cystic fibrosis patients. So 58 patients. And we went back and looked at patients who had topical therapy uh, with antibiotics versus those that didn't, and there was no signal. This is the cytonasal outcomes test, so our most used uh, sinus quality of life instrument. It's not 20. Now we use the SNOT 22, but uh, there was no difference in the SNOT 20 score, so it really didn't change patient symptoms. Um, on endoscopy, though, the Lund Kennedy is our most recognized endoscopy score. It looks at things like polyps, pus, edema, scarring, and crusting, those five. Items. And there was a significant reduction in patients who used topical antibiotics versus those who didn't. Uh, and when we looked at the culture clearance cure rate, so see a patient, you take a culture, you put them on topical antibiotics, they come back a month later, you take another culture. 72% of the time in the patients that took a topical antibiotic, the pathogen did not grow out in the lab. What does that mean? Well, it didn't change their patient's severity symptoms. So that's kind of unfortunate, but maybe it affected the pathogen a little bit. That gave us enough data, though, to look at uh, using this in a randomized fashion. And we did a three-arm study looking at povidone iodine versus mupirocine versus saline. And we did povidone iodine because 3M came out with these nasal swabs that are coated with povidone iodine. The idea is to use these swabs prior to surgery to help prevent post-operative staph infections, specifically in cardiothoracic surgery and joint replacement surgery, where normally you would ask a patient to use mupirocine for five days, applying it to their nose twice a day. There is a study that showed there's only 20% compliance with that, versus again, when the nurse uses a 3M product, it's 100% compliance. So we weren't going to just swab the nose, because that's not going to do anything. We said, well, let's just squirt some iodine up the nose, and let's squirt mupirocine piercing up the nose at the proper dose, which is an entire tube of your piercing to get the proper dose, proper concentrate to make it bactericidal. Um, the compounded version is a nice little capsule, so most patients will go for that, but insurance pays for the tube, they often don't pay for the capsule. And then we compared it to saline. Uh, the downside in retrospect about this study is that we continued with normal treatment. So normal standard of care treatment for these patients who come in with an active sinus disease is sometimes prednisone, uh, topical steroids like the desinite, and then antibiotics as well. So those are huge confounders for this study. Uh, we did it for 30 days. They were randomized. Uh, 
I was blinded uh, as to what treatment they were on. The patient obviously was not blinded because they were mixing it up and squirting it up the nose. We looked at the same uh, outcome measures, culture negativity, snot scores, endoscopy scores, and then pathology. <coughs> we had 22 patients in each arm. There was, again, uh, with this study, no significant difference in culture negativity, but what this graph is trying to show is that the new piercing had a 70% culture negativity, meaning 30% of the time the pathogen was still there, 70% of the time the pathogen was gone. But almost half of the saline group also had culture negativity. Saline works, but maybe it's the antibiotics that they were on as well. And the zone. So that, that was why we didn't find statistical significance is because the new piercing is really being compared against um, normal treatment, which works in, in most of our patients, as we know. Uh, SNOT 20 scores didn't change again at all, and endoscopy scores didn't change either. So this was essentially uh, a negative study. Um, it was well tolerated. The potent iodine was a 9 out of 100 on a visual analog scale, so that's easy. There was one patient who didn't like it because it uh, drained out of his nose at night and stained his pillowcase. So <laughs> he withdrew from the study for that reason. But otherwise, all three of those were, were well tolerated. So we conclude in Mupiracine, it does give some post-treatment culture negativity. Um, this was specifically for staph and strep. Uh, but potent iodine and saline also worked well. Uh, and again, that's just for eradicating a pathogen temporarily. So we were missing... Where are these cultures coming from? These cultures were coming directly from the site. So when I take a culture, I use a straight endoscope and either a, a very small culture swab uh, or I use a little suction device. It's like a li little sputum's trap. It's about three millimeters wide, and I slide it right into the sinus and suck out the pot. So it's not getting contaminants from the nasal cavity with the normal nasal floor like a standard swab. Would do. Great. With your bupyrosin and your 15 grams, how much saline do you dilute that in? In the 240 cc. 240. And that's the cream, not the ointment that you use? Correct, yeah. Yeah, I have a, uh, I'm happy to, that Drew, you have it too, our, our Cascade Pharmacy sheet. It'll say that what the correct recipe is in case, because it might be the 22 gram too. <coughs> I'm kind of thinking it might not be the 15, even though that picture was a 15. Um, so we can get that in. And did you find that many of those people complaining of anosmia? Because that's the complaint that I, I learned from my old mentor, and that's why he switched away from that. So we're going to talk about that in a, in, uh, at, towards the end. Oh, um, it's, but since you brought it up, so these things are all off-label, and it's important that you talk to your patient before doing it. Every well, augmented for the chronic sinusitis is off-label. Discuss that with them. But these things, when we're talking about spraying something up their nose, uh, that is one of the risk factors to, to discuss injury to olfactory tissue. Um, we didn't have any reports of it. We did not measure olfaction in these studies. We have a couple future studies coming up with industry, and that is one of the things that we're measuring is olfaction. Most of these patients who come in have impaired olfaction already because of their chronic sinus disease. They would be enrolled in the study if they did. This is not a group of healthy. So this, this biofilm buster issue. Uh, Before we move on, yes. so does anybody have any decent literature that topical antibiotics work in this disease? Yeah. Uh, you know, these companies I haven't looked in a long time that sell or compound uh, mail order selling of uh, topical antibiotics for this. I, I've always assumed it was snake oil. Yeah, there's no. Yes, and so let's see, what was your question? Is there good research that shows it works? No, no, is the answer. So no, there's not good research, and the, what research there is, such as what I just showed you, isn't that great of research um, for the various reasons. Uh, so yeah, this is still snake oil at this point in time. And you know, it might help decrease the pathogen load. There are patients that I use it on, uh, just topical antibiotics, and they love it. The other benefit, though, Let's say we get 
drug-resistant or cipro-resistant pseudomonas, which is very common in chronic sinus disease in my population, especially in cystic fibrosis patients. And the only thing we have are intravenous antibiotics for them. Some of the uh, some of the MRSA drugs or pathogens are also very drug resistant. We can use intravenous drugs like gentamicin, tobramycin, and irrigate up the nose. Does that help? Yeah, we don't have research to support using it. So if, if a patient comes to me and they don't have the financial resources and they say, should I really do this? I'll say, yeah, I don't, we don't have evidence to support doing it. I think it's reasonable to try. If it's not going to hurt you, let's give it a shot. Many of my patients with staph, which is the most common pathogen that I see, do like the piercing irrigations. And we'll do it twice a day for a month, and they feel it helps. But insurance companies aren't jumping on the bandwagon and say, yeah, this is the best thing. So we're still in the snake oil category. Speaking of snake oil, let's talk about Manuka honey. Uh, Manuka honey, is anybody ever use it on their toast or jam or eating it at all? So Manuka honey, it's, this stuff's been around. It's made from the uh, Manuka region of New Zealand by these little honeybees, and they pollinate predominantly on this tree, which is a tea tree. You've heard of tea tree oil. You probably, I bet you've had a patient that has sprayed or irrigated tea tree oil up their nose. We have a few. They swear by it. And it's been thought that it, it's, it's bactericidal, it uh, affects the, this bio glue, this, this uh, matrix of material that walls off the pathogen from uh, the blood supply that helps it create a very sticky environment so it, it, it adheres to the host. And it works great in vitro. Uh, it, it definitely does those things. It's just a little bit about the biofilm. Uh, so Manuka honey is used Actually, at the Harborview Burn Center, and it's used in many hospitals for chronic burns uh, because of its anti-staph, anti-biofilm properties, which is surprising. So we said, well, let's just squirt it up the nose and see what happens. Um, there's a lot of different Manuka honeys out there. Uh, you can get them on, at Trader Joe's or on Amazon. This is one that I'll occasionally recommend. It's a Comvita product. But the one that we did a trial on is using Medi Honey. And that's the one that the hospital carries. It's, quote, medicine-grade Manuka honey, which means it's been gamma-radiated, so there's no potential for spores or pathogens to be present. And uh, they ensure that there's quality control, so it's a consistent process of making it, versus these other ones are just cosmetics. Um, and we you don't really know what goes into it. So the, the Medi honey, uh, we published this recently. We had a grant from the company that makes it. They supplied the material, uh, but had nothing else to do with the study. And in this randomized trial, we took uh, just under 50 patients, a randomized end of the Nuka honey versus saline. Again, at this point, this is about a year and a half ago, we weren't ready to say, let's do Manuka honey versus no treatment. We weren't ready then. We're planning to see, we're ready now studies. But this study, we weren't there, so we were still offering standard of care. Um, no surprise, just like the empiricine code on iodine, no change in the SNOT-22 score, so no change in symptom severity after using this product for a month. Uh, no change in the endoscopy score, so this is really looking like a negative study. And it was. It was a negative study. Uh, no treatment, uh, no post-treatment culture negativity. It didn't even really do that significantly, so yeah, you know, it, there was uh, the higher the better. So 42% of uh, the pathogens were uh, still present. So, sorry, were uh, eradicated versus only 19% of the pathogens in the saline group were eradicated. It wasn't uh, statistically significant, though. So more bugs were killed with the new honey. Um, but it didn't affect anything. And so we're thinking, yeah, this is snake oil. And we had a group of those... 49 patients who entered the study, we had 16 patients, sorry, uh, 22 patients who elected not to take oral antibiotics or oral steroids. That was, they self-selected to avoid that. So now we have this little subgroup, and doing a retrospective post hoc analysis on this is really just hypothesis generating. It wasn't powered to do this study. 
We said, all right, we have people who just did Manuka honey irrigations versus just did saline irrigations. Great, this is kind of the study we were hoping for. No significant difference in their symptoms with SNOP 22, no significant difference in the endoscopy. But when we took cultures, 50% of the Manuka honey patients had no pathogen present on their post treatment culture versus in the saline group, all of those patients, zero is bad. 100% of the patients threw out the same pathogen they had before. It's only six patients, but six out of six, if they had staph or pseudomonas before treatment, six out of six still had staph or pseudomonas after treatment, versus only half of those patients in the minute time. So maybe there's something to it. Maybe, but at the end of the day, it's not affecting the patient. So in my opinion, this is still a very negative study and uh, slightly disappointing, but that's what it is. You always have the event of one patient, though, and this is a patient who came in uh, to enroll in the study. Uh, they've had sinus surgery. They're very edematous. There's trusting. There's purulent material. This is looking right inside the maxillary sinus. It's a little blurry. Using a flexible scope, uh, the optics aren't quite as good. This is after using antibiotics, prednisone, and manuka honey. And now it looks like we actually did surgery. This is looking right up into the frontal sinus. It looks beautiful. The edema is gone. And this is just 30 days later. So the edema is gone. The mucopurulent material is gone. Everybody's happy. Well, this patient comes back two months later, another infection. They took the same antibiotic and the same prednisone, but didn't have the manuka honey, and they have edema and pus again. And this patient's asking me for more manuka honey. And I'm kind of shaking my head saying, I don't think it's the manuka honey, but they said, I swear it's the manuka honey. That stuff worked great. You know, people will buy snake oil. They did a century ago, and they will now. And, and I'm not convinced that Manuka honey is the right thing, uh, yes or no. But there's something, I believe, to it. And I think what it is is, I think in the future, if we're going to really target topical therapies, we have to take it not as just a one-drug wonder approach. We have to treat the inflammation with steroids. We have to treat the pathogen, which is another topic. Is it really a pathogen or is it a microbiome? That's a whole other lecture. Uh, and we have to treat, if there is biofilm, we have to treat that with something. Uh, and maybe in the future it's a cocktail of all three. Can you see the biofilms when you look endoscopically? Is it visually enough difference for you to say this is a biofilm and this isn't? Not at all. And it's pretty hard to measure as well. Some sophisticated, you can't just send it to the lab and ask. It takes some significant uh, assays to test for it. I was afraid you were going to say that. If you were to mix the budesonide with the honey, would that improve the maybe penetration or efficacy or the biofilm, the just penetration of the corpus steroid, give it an added effect? That's probably what needs to be done. So I think you're right. Um, and that's where I think in, in the future, and, and I've toyed with the idea of writing a grant to do a topical. What I would love to do, the ideal grant, that I want to help if you can, would be compare oral antibiotics and prednisone versus topical antibiotics and prednisone and something like the honey mixed together to see, you know, really, can we get away from that oral delivery of medications to treat the sinuses? Because it just doesn't work that good. And if the sinuses are open, we should be able to treat it topical. I looked ahead before I ask a stupid question, but are you talking about mucolytics in these people? Like, have you thought about adding N acetylcysteine? We can't get access to pulmazine because it's too expensive, but you can get mucomus pretty cheap. Yeah, we, uh, the compounding pharmacy does give N acetylcysteine, or we can use that. Uh, it wasn't there, there was a, doesn't it can exacerbate asthma? Yeah, and it yeah. stinks. I mean, it's really it's, bad. It's yeah. So I've used it a couple good. times, but what are your thoughts about that? Is it good, bad, ugly? Well, I'm, you know, again, I'm, the ones I send to you are the ones I can't fix, but mine have usually tried all this stuff before they ever get to you. And, you know, like you, I've seen some anecdotal support that says that mucolytic really works, but these are people who are desperate not to have surgery. So I'm not sure I can't scope them, so I don't know whether they're just telling me they feel better or they really but they do seem, some, some seem to get better, but I mix the budesonide with the N-acetylcysteine and a topical antibiotic, and they sort of get this cocktail up their nose to see if that can work. I haven't added Manuka honey yet, though. I still have one more thing to add. I don't know if I'd add it yet. 
<laughs> I just wondered when you went there with a scope, if you could actually put that in, still that while you're in looking around and just put in some. It's possible. The, uh, the pharmacies can mix it up as a thick gel, and you can deliver the gel. Uh, I, you know, we don't even know if this works, let alone paying extra money to, to do that procedure in some way. It makes sense. It'd be nice to squirt something up the nose. For years, people used to squirt, and some surgeons still do, used to squirt uh, neosporin in the sinuses at the conclusion of doing sinus surgery. And there was reports of uh, people having these cementomas, these the, like a giant cell reaction to a wad of neosporin. And just last week, I was doing a revision <laughs> surgery. Someone in, around the area did their primary surgery, and I know he's a neosporin foreign believer, and I sucked out this huge wad from the frontal sinus, you know, the size of, of a, a small Super Bowl, uh, of Neosporin, and the surgery was over a year ago. So, uh, you yeah, know, we got to be careful what we squirt up the nose. You yeah. call that a cementoma? <laughs> if there is anything to Manuka honey, is it's unique because of what the bees uh, feed on, is that the point, the tea tree, or? I'm, How did anybody ever stumble on this in the first place? It may be one of the smartest marketing gimmicks ever. <laughs> from, uh, <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. I don't know how the Nikahani trend started decades ago. I don't know how it got approved for use at the burn center. Uh, but in vitro, it does help, and it does show... There's pretty neat evidence that if you apply Manuka honey to a dish of Staph aureus with biofilm versus saline to the same dish, and you squirt it with saline, that Manuka, that Staph will just wash right off the agar gel. It, it, it won't stick anymore. So, it's, And it does kill bacteria at the same time. So the thought is that it just breaks down that, that stickiness, that glue. Whether or not mucolytic would do the same thing. I think we have even less evidence. You can miss this cheap, and it's probably not going to hurt anything, so uh, there's no reason not to do it. Oh, you'll see the ones that it doesn't work on, so <laughs> you'll get to see it. Oh, we need to talk about the ones that it does work on. <laughs> see those uh, and just a, the last slide, so now getting out of what's on the horizon. So because of these studies that we've done here at DW over the last few years, I get contacted by different companies from time to time, and... Uh, these, have, these were recently published, and we'll talk about some unpublished stuff, uh, bacteriophage. So these are viruses that target Staph aureus. And yes. ex vivo, it worked, it helped, and there's a company called Amplify uh, that wants to do a randomized trial of helping design, and we're going to infuse viruses against Staph bacteriophage. Should be interesting. You'll get that through your bioethics committee. <laughs> they haven't tried yet. <laughs> so see. Uh, photodynamic therapy. So this is photoactivation, laser activation of uh, usually methylene blue to create free radicals to kill bacteria and not injure the host tissue. That's been published several times. And in animal models, uh, it works pretty well. It's also in use and approved for use up in Canada local company uh, called Ondi, they make this device called SinuWave, and you put it a little catheter in the sinus.
find that both uh, in the post-operative setting and in the treatment setting. Um, sinus surgery has a zero global period, zero day global period, unlike almost every other surgery out there. Most other surgeries, anytime the, the cost of surgery and the cost of the post-surgical treatment for 90 days is wrapped up in that price of surgery. So if I do a septoplasty, and I see the patient back at month one and month two, I don't get any more money for those visits. It's part of the post-operative period that's already been paid. Sinus surgery is different. If I see the patient day one after surgery, I get a bill then for a clinic visit. If I do endoscopy, I get a bill for the endoscopy. If I do it day two, same thing, I can bill for it. So there's a real strange incentive for surgeons to see their sinus patients. The reason the AMA made it that way is because they recognize that some patients need more surgical post-op care than others. Sometimes we have to debris more based on the surgery we do. Most of us will say it's ethical to do one sinus debridement after surgery, maybe two on the rare exception, but there are surgeons out there who will see their patients back once a week for a month or more, and I don't think that's the right practice. Uh, if I do a sinus endoscopy, it's about $250, I, uh, and that you double that, double, double that. The charge for a sinus debridement in clinic which takes maybe 10, 15 minutes, it's like $2,500. So you can see the, the dark side of the incentive system. One last question, I'm hogging your time, but you didn't say anything about balloon sinus surgery. Are you gonna stay away from that on purpose, or? Uh, no, I, we can put that on the docket for next year. <laughs> uh, it's, it's interesting, we started doing it at the university just last year, we took forever to agree to do it. Uh, Balloon sinus dilation in a nutshell, that's a whole other lecture. Uh, I think it's a good technology for people with uh, proven return acute sinusitis, proven on CT scan, uh, or barrel pressure, sinus problems, uh, divers, pilots who, who just have very tight sinuses that feel that pressure when they fly or change altitude. Uh, there is no balloon that's approved for use in the ethmoids, and balloons cannot address ethmoid sinus surgery or ethmoid disease. Uh, they cannot take anything out, so if there's a mass or a fungal ball or mycetoma or really thick pus in there, it can't get it out, it just dilates it a bit. So in my practice, very few people meet criteria for balloon sinus dilation. In my criteria, and it doesn't mean you couldn't justify using it on a lot of other people. So I just saw one of my, my son's 17, one of his good friends he plays baseball with saw one of our local ENTs who offered him balloon sinus dilation, the frontal sphenoid and maxillary sinuses. And I, the family knew me, and so they said, hey, can you take a look at the scan? And he had a huge mass in his sphenoid sinus and complete opacification of the ethmoids. The balloon never would have touched the ethmoids and wouldn't have gotten the mass out of the sphenoid sinus. So why is this surgeon offering balloon sinus dilation? That's wrong. It's the wrong surgery for that patient. Um, and one step further, if I use a balloon in my clinic and I just operate on one sinus, I lose my clinic, the university loses money. If I operate on two or more, we make money. So how's that for an incentive? <laughs> it's, you know, you really, it's a slippery slope. It's easy to justify using it, and not just for one sinus, and maybe you only need to do one sinus. So, well, you know, that one looks a little tight. Let's dilate that too while we're here. It's a sunk cost when you buy the balloon. It's one balloon for all sinuses now. It used to be different. So the balloon codes will change, and the incentive system will change in the future to where it's not so lucrative right now. But uh, be cautious of people if they're using a lot of balloons. I think there's a practice for it, and there's a couple surgeons in the community that do very good balloon work, and, and I'm glad that they do that, but it can be abused. Um, it's not used. Thank you. While we're talking about unproven things, I'll say I have about a half dozen people that I've used cyclosporin, thinking that this is not an infectious disease, this is a T-cell driven auto-inflammatory disease, and again, 
you know, just open empiric medicine, they report very good results. Uh, they stop having this chronic mucopurulent drainage and they clinically feel a lot better. Um, that's, that's not valid. Not, not valid. Opinion is on this that we you see pus, it doesn't mean that it's infected. I agree. I agree. So even when we culture out a pathogen, you know, is is the pathogen the source of the disease process, or is it a result of the disease process? And more and more, we're understanding that it's an inflammatory process. If we control the inflammation, the body will take care of the pus, quote infection. So whether or not cyclosporin methotrexate, I think, uh, or just prednisone. Just is the risk worth it? Is the immunosuppression worth it? Is the side effects of the drug worth it? Probably better than taking chronic prednisone. Yeah, that's my and opinion. Paul, I know you've had some complex patients <coughs> with uh, Ollie and Frank as well uh, of using those drugs from time to time. You know, I just wish I was better at keeping records because the ones that get better I sort of forget about and the ones that don't get better come to you. So it's sort of like you yeah. can tell me all the things. Well, I was going to say the patient's lens talking about maybe, you know, well, the ones that will say, you know, I am not having another surgery. <laughs> so it, kind of, it puts you in a, you know, and in some cases you have to, you know, show them their scan and say, you know, and, and you see this medical failure maybe, that you have to sort of say, you know, well, we need a clean slate again, so to speak. But that's, that's often what comes with it. So they kind of shove you in a corner, well, what can we safely do? And then the, the no surgery is followed you know, by prednisone is the only thing that helps, which, which probably is true, so to speak, or they won't stick with the topical stuff. So it's, it's a tough group of patients. I, I also get the no surgery comment. Which always surprises me. I'm like, huh, all right, did you see the sign on the door? <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. Do you know what I do? But uh, I think, you know, in that situation, it's important to ask them, well, what was so bad about your last surgery? Right, ninety percent of the time, do you know what they'll say? Packing. Yeah, pulling out yeah. the packing hurt like yeah. hell. Yeah. So, does anybody well, pack anymore? There's still a lot of people who pack the nose, oh my God. Yeah. and it's just it's needs to change. Most people in our community pack the nose still. The majority do, despite efforts to try to change that. You know, the packing's awful. They, the end of surgery, they put just so you know, they put packing in to control the bleeding. Take 10 minutes at the end of surgery to zap the, the bleeding tissue or use topical epinephrine, 1 to 1,000 we use now. Take time to stop the bleeding at the time of surgery while they're still asleep under, on the table. That's my philosophy. Because you put in that packing, it induces a massive inflammatory response. Plus, the patients hate it. They don't like you, and you have to pull it out. Then it bleeds. <laughs> Horrible. So it's, there are times where I tell patients I don't pack the nose, I haven't in 10 years, and I've had patients cry out of happiness, like, oh my God, if I didn't do that eight years ago, I would have came in for surgery. So I, you know, when you hear that, ask them why, and, and that's often the answer. And then find a surgeon that doesn't pack the right. Thank you so much. Thanks once again. Thank yeah, and thank you all of you. you know, I, every patient I see, I tell them it's a team. I need you to work with your allergist to control the inflammation, and I do my part, the allergist does your part. So it, I'm glad we're working together. So we hope we can have you back next year. Yeah, we thought about this next year. Sounds good. That's a good topic. It's, it's so much industry. Hi, Dr. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Did, did she come see you ever? Yes, no, she did. She's a wonderful thing for us. Oh, yeah. Is she doing better? I don't know. She did. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. This is a very wide dealer. I've done it for a year. She has asthma and contacts. She did have a lot of wish we could. Just answer questions. She's always got better with a. Okay, you have mail here. Yes. Yeah. So, so.
sound went down yeah, for about, yeah. about five, ten minutes or so. I got it up, yeah, yeah, up I I it. So yeah, I got so an email from Mike. Right. 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 So I do so remember her. Yeah. Yeah. I remember yeah. her talking about you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it, it was it was up still or the So yeah, so we're getting trapped. Yeah, so I talked to her OB and the OB thought I will. The last one was the first thing she said. So she, she was just doing it on her own. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Rick said yeah. that they were to just wait. Is Greg and you use iodine? Do you use straight iodine or do you use Yeah, that's all you do. Yeah, that's why I do the iodine. Yeah, I think that's why I do the iodine. So we use straight iodine. So there's two types of beta. There's an iodine scrub. Scrub, which we don't use. That's how I have to do it. I don't know if there's a better way to do that. But I get them to do it. And I think that's really the key. Yeah, is they yeah, don't just sure. do it. So. Uh, yeah, I think you know, it all, it's yeah, depends yeah, what you're trying to target. So for the frontals, I'm definitely telling them that all of yeah, those are And basically and touch your head to the floor. And, pull it out. And, and we have one surgeon once we will burn everything. And no, it's, I, no, I, it's the same I was talking yeah. It's just, it's difficult because he does it in his office. He doesn't use hospitals, so he says he can do it a lot cheaper, so that's appealing to people. And then he says he can blend all the ethmoid sinuses and does it pull the He says he can't do that. Yeah, oh, yeah, I can. And it's like, well, yeah, well I don't know. Technically, you can't. There's no way. Even technically, even in a cadaver, you can't balloon the ethmoids. See, that's what I need to know. I don't, I don't have that kind of skill that I can say no confidently and say, well, you know, maybe he can do it and nobody else can. Now I can just say no. And I can say, I know for, for a fact you can't. How did you learn about that? that? So, I mean, there's, there's all oh, this conversation going on. Yeah, here, let me, Thank uh, you again. Let me grab Travis real quick, too, because the screen is frozen, so it's still... I won't stop recording, so it's not How did you enjoy the presentation this morning? Uh, excellent. Yeah. yeah. Are we a sponsor for this? No. So no. Boston Scientific, we talked before, yeah. the bronchoplasty, but um, yeah, I cover a couple of different states, but I live here locally, so I'm in town. I'm going to start coming and well, today is a uh, participating discussion and looking to bring in breakfast when it is. Okay. Let's... Uh, Morning. Yes, 
started coming in through here. Conversation between the two of them? Yeah. 